You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Daniel Sinner. In today's discussion, we're debating cosmetic surgery. The medical director of the National Health Service, Sir Bruce Keogh, says there needs to be a major overhaul on cosmetic surgery procedures, such as Botox, implants and liposuction. Sir Bruce has warned that safety issues and a normalisation of a cosmetic surgery culture are a crisis waiting to happen. His review comes in the aftermath of the PIP breast implant scandal, where implants were found to contain silicone for use in mattresses, rather than sterile medical silicone. At the moment, anyone can become a practitioner, injecting patients with dermal fillers to reduce the signs of wrinkles. Now, tougher controls over who can offer treatments and a review of advertising have been urged by the NHS to better regulate the 2.3 billion pound industry, which could see treatments becoming prescription only. Sir Bruce also criticised television programmes and glossy celebrity magazines for normalising cosmetic surgery and even celebrating operations. The recommendations have been welcomed by the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons. But will his recommendations have any impact on a booming industry that's forecast to rise to £3.6 billion by 2015? Joining me for today's discussion is Mr Nilesh Sojitra, a plastic surgeon and a member of the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons. Linda Briggs is one of the UK's leading independent cosmetic surgery advisors and has had over £30,000 of cosmetic surgery. And Sarah Burge has had over 150 cosmetic procedures and is an associate of many cosmetic surgery clinics worldwide. Let's begin with Mr. Nilesh Sojitra, a plastic surgeon. Do you agree with Sir Bruce Keogh when he says that, that cosmetic surgery has been normalised? Absolutely. In the last couple of years, there's been a lot of media interest. There's been the introduction of a lot of programmes like TAWI, where the vulnerable young youngsters think procedures are, are just something you walk in you know, during your lunch hour and then have them done and there's absolutely no risks or, or more. They don't think about the risks. They just look at the, the glamorous aspects of it. You know, especially in the light of recent problems with macrolane, for example, um, advertised as a, as, as a lunchtime boob job procedure. And now it's banned because of issues around um, mammographic screening. Sarah Bird, you've already had at least 150 operations. Do you think that there is a culture of normalisation? Um, yes, I do to a certain extent. And I do agree, but I'm not sure that uh, prescription only is going to solve um, a growing problem because I think this is going to send more casualties into the NHS due to the fact that so many people are too shy and embarrassed to in fact go to their GPs and want them as a provider of cosmetic fillers or Botox and I think people will be then fast tracking themselves through A&E because they're going to go the DIY route and get it off the internet. I think that is going to open up more problems and actually the solution to be honest uh, and linda briggs you're an independent cosmetic surgery advisor but you've also had plastic surgery yourself do you think mm -hmm. there is this culture of normalization well it's um life changes and ideas change and this is the modern way that people want to live they have the right to do what they want and they see cosmetic surgery as a new lifestyle and if that's what they want to do then yes that's fine nobody can stop them now, you had your first surgery at 45, and you say you, you can do what you want with your body, but why did you have the surgery that you did, the facelift and the eyelid lift as well? Well, I, I worked in the law as a lawyer, and uh, I'd got 15 years left before I retired, and I was looking very tired. And um, although my experience was um, vast and still growing at that age, um, I kept being overlooked for all sorts of things because, I've, you know, with only 15 years to go, they thought I was on the scrap heap and I was going further and further up the building at the back of building and not seeing uh, clients to speak to. So uh, anyway, I had the facelift and my life changed after that. Now, Sarah, you've had a, a lot more operations than Linda has. Why have you had all these operations? Well, I had my first operation at the age of seven when I had my ear pin back, which I considered a deformity. So I'm being I was a vain little cow even back then, to be fair. But then uh, my life completely changed at the age of 29 when uh, I was beaten to a pulp by a jealous lover who uh, actually destroyed my face. I had to have, therefore, reconstructive surgery over the 
following seven years. And uh, so obviously that did change my life. I, I know exactly what it's like to look good and then feel very ugly and then obviously back to feeling and looking good about myself. So plastic surgery did indeed save my life and change my life. You have had a lot of surgery. Would you say you're addicted to it? Um, well, addicted is rather a strong word. I'm addicted to looking good. And if, <laughs> and if I didn't look good, I'd probably be on the dole or on the scrap heap. So, I mean, it's a big part of my business. Dr. Nilesh Sojitra, you obviously come across a lot of people who want to have plastic surgery. Is there a worry about addiction that people could be on this treadmill of wanting to continue having lots of operations? In Sarah's case, obviously... I take it she would have been cancelled about the risks and she would have had a process of informed consent, being aware of what can go wrong and can't go wrong, and then she can make a sort of valued decision as to whether she wants to go ahead. And that, that's the danger when there's people who do not inform consent of patients and more advertise and just talk about the glamorous aspects rather than the risky sides. Then there's a sort of problem that we need to, to think about. But as long as a patient is adequately informed, then it's fine to have the, um, the surgical procedure, assuming they, they need it. One of the key concerns of Sir Bruce was that young girls are being exposed to this culture. Um, he found that 41% of girls between 7 and 10 and 63% between the age of 11 and 16 felt pressure to look like celebrities. Do you think there, there is this culture and that, that there needs to be the protection that he says there needs to be? It is a worrying trend due to uh, teenagers and younger than that in the surveys that we've done at BARPS looking at what celebrities do. And there is a proportion of, of these youngsters who suffer from body dysmorphic disorder. And there's a small proportion of patients who we refer routinely to psychologists, maybe before they have the procedure or maybe to treat what they what what they feel is a is a, is a problem and sometimes in their cases it avoids a surgical procedure Sarah you've got a nine-year-old daughter do you worry that having all these procedures sends the wrong message to her no absolutely not I mean uh, Poppy that's who you're referring to has been brought up in a household of plastic surgery and obviously I'm involved with many plastic surgeons I'm a nurse myself I carry out treatments I operate the largest referral service throughout the world uh, for what's clearly considered good cosmetic surgery she actually wants to be a plastic surgeon when she's older no I don't think it sends out the wrong message I think it sends out a very positive message she knows where she's going in her life and she's clued up and in intelligent young girl but this has become a celebrity cult following and I do see it in the playground with um, her peers and they're all interested in sort of am I too fat am I too thin you know uh, do I need a turned up nose do I need this? and and that is quite scary it can be quite scary but, but if, if Poppy sees her, hears her friend say this in the playground and sees you having all these operations do you, do you worry that she's not going to love herself for who she is she's going to feel like I might want to have all these operations to correct the things that my friends are all concerned about yeah but there's nothing wrong with the way my daughter looks. I mean, what you've got to remember and what you fail to forget is that I was actually disfigured and I lived with disfigurement for seven years and I sure as hell know which I would prefer to look like and it's the person sitting in front of you right now. Poppy um, realises the fact she knows my backstory and she realises that cosmetic surgery, it does change your life to a certain extent but it doesn't doesn't have to come at the expense of everything else I mean you can sort of like be beautiful on the inside and on the outside as well and change is good sometimes if you're not happy with something then I would totally agree with trying to change it but you have to take the right course of action you have to go to the right place you have to go to the right man for the job so to speak not the cowboys there was a lot of criticism around uh, a lot of publicity for uh, you gave your daughter some plastic surgery vouchers now obviously you said she can cash these in if she wants to continue her education for a plastic surgeon. But to give her vouchers which clearly say on it plastic surgery, are you concerned about the impact you might have on her body image? No, her I mean, the, body the, image? this has been totally distorted by the press and sensationalised. I mean, mm. I, I'm an astute businesswoman, so I was given these vouchers by various outlets throughout the world and they are actually, I use them as bonds. So as I'm in the industry myself, I then change somebody else's life who's been disfigured, say they're out in America they've been bitten by a dog and I would sell that at a discount price to them to, in order to change their life so because they couldn't get the pro bono work done and they don't have a national health service and that money was then banked for my daughter and she's actually gone and bought a horse now so. <laughs> um, Mr Nilesh Sojitra what, what are your thoughts on what you've just heard from Sarah? I think what she says is what the press have said about her is a whole different thing from what she's saying today but there is a danger of 
selling vouchers and mm. encouraging people to have something that they might not need. You're listening to the Voice of Russia in London. I'm Daniel Sinner, and today we're discussing cosmetic surgery. Joining me is Mr. Nilash Sajitra, a plastic surgeon and a member of the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons. Linda Briggs is one of the UK's leading independent cosmetic surgery advisors and has had over £30,000 of cosmetic surgery. And Sarah Burge has had over 150 cosmetic procedures and is an associate of many cosmetic surgery clinics worldwide. Linda Briggs, there's been a lot of concern about cosmetic surgery and the culture that it has. And some people say, why not let children enjoy their childhood? Why should they be subject to programmes like TOWIE? To me, children should be children as long as they want to be. Then when they get to be adult, if they've got a good enough reason for wanting something done, then if they're sensible people and they're well balanced, then, you know, why not? It's their choice. There, there is that question of well balance. There was a, a former Korean model who was addicted to plastic surgery mm. and she ended up injecting herself with cooking oil and diagnosed with a medical condition. Do you feel there are enough safeguards in place to protect people that are vulnerable? They'll always find a way. The people that have got these disorders, they do find a way of making themselves seem reasonable, sensible and intelligent. And it's difficult to see through it. You know, I, I couldn't possibly see through it. I'm not a psychologist. And I don't think a lot of surgeons can either. You can tell to a point, but it's not sometimes until after you've done the procedures. I'm sure our surgeon friend will agree. You don't realise they're a nutcase until afterwards. And then it's too late. And then you have to deal with the, the fallout. But isn't it harder to, to deal with that if you haven't got safeguards in place, if anyone can set themselves up as a practitioner injecting dermal fillers to reduce the sign of wrinkles? I don't know. You need all these. Th th this report is good in principle. Yes, I totally agree with it. You do need more regulation. And this is why I started my business when I did in 1999. That There was nothing in place then. There wasn't even specialist registration at that time. Um, and I wanted to inform patients, give them informed choices. And the surgeons at that time didn't want to give me the information to supply to the patients. This report should address that. It's whether it's workable and it can happen. Do you think it is workable? Can these recommendations be put into practice? Uh, some of it, from what I've read, I mean, there's 65 pages here, and uh, a lot of it I've read, yes, it's sensible. They've been given the right advice from the right um, specialists. And it, it should be workable. The one thing that I did pick out was that they wanted GPs to be involved. Now, cosmetic surgery, probably Sarah will back me up on this, you don't want your GP to know. It's nothing to do with him. No, that's what I said earlier. They feel embarrassed and shy and primarily GPs are there to sort of help the sick, not worry about people's lines and wrinkles. I mean, it's a complete waste of uh, NHS are, are, resources. Are they there to make sure that these procedures go through properly and there are, there are proper medical regulations in place? But then who's going to prescribe? Is a doctor going to prescribe? Is a GP to then take your prescription where? Where's it going to go? Or are they going to carry out the treatment? Well, let's find out from Mr Nilesh Sajitra, because obviously uh, BAPS welcomed this recommendation in themselves. They've put in place insurance for any of the members who have any operations from a member yeah. of BAPS. What are your thoughts? I mean, I think the importance of the GP is not to prescribe, but for the surgeon to liaise with the GP and most of the BARPS procedures, but BARPS registered surgeons will do that just in case, for example, body dysmorphic disorder. There's other things in the patient's history which your patient's not telling you. So it's more they for that rather than yeah. prescribing there. But don't you think people with body morphic disorder, they find clever ways of getting around everybody, including their GP? They do, they do, but there are surgeons in the country when there's a doubt, they will still operate on the patient. Mm. Oh, exactly. That's the problem. Yeah, it's the commercial decision. Rather than mm. sending it to a psychologist or rather than saying no, there is a commoditization of, of mm. surgery. How do you make sure that there are those regulations in place? Do you think you do need a GP involved? Though? Well, I mean, it goes back to the specialist register. There's surgeons working in London who are not on the specialist register in reputable hospitals. This kind of brings Linda in here. Linda, you fly in practitioners from around the world, and it's something that, that Sir Bruce has specifically criticised, the fly-in, fly-out surgeons, not based in the UK, who are qualified to do surgery, such as ENT, ear, nose and throat, but not to do plastic surgery. Do you think these regulations are necessary? These fly-in, fly-out surgeons are nothing to do with me. We don't do it the same way. Um, the surgeons that I bring into the UK are GMC specialist registered surgeons, usually from France and other European countries. They come over here to do consultations only. Um, they do have admitting rights and practising rights to do the work here, but usually they don't because of the cost of it. 
And this is why they would take the patients to other countries. What do you think about the register that Sir Bruce Keogh has recommended? It sounds like a very good idea, if it's workable and if it doesn't become a bureaucratic nightmare and a revenue-gathering exercise, which is what it normally works out at. But this, this, he says, is going to be able to filter out dodgy um, dodgy practitioners who are buying uh, equipment that they don't know where it's from, whether it's mm. sterile, whether it's medically useful. Yeah, possibly it will. Um, but you have got clever people with criminal minds that will find a way around it. There, there always will be. No, I think we have to start somewhere and do the process. There's always going to be an element of pushing things underground, like in any society. But that's another problem to regulate with the police and the government. But I think if we don't make this initial step, then it's already open for people to do, th- do it as it is. People can come in, consult in, I want to mention any streets... But you can hire a room, you can be anyone, you don't even have to be a doctor, you don't even have to be on the GMC register. You see a patient, take them to sit elsewhere in another country, operate on them there. There's risks of if something goes wrong, where does the patient stand? If it's a long flight, where does the patient stand with DVTs? They shouldn't, they shouldn't be carrying out treatments. Mm. And I know we talked um, earlier in the news about Botox and fillers being done in beauty salons and mm. hairdressers and whatever. Yes, that may be so, but there are practitioners, medical practitioners, that are actually going into these beauty houses and carrying out the treatments. It's not some beautician or hairdresser that's sticking a needle in somebody, as far as I'm aware, unless they're becoming a voodoo witch, doc- witch doctor and getting it off the internet. And there just are deciding- some people doing that, exactly. There's some people setting themselves up as practitioners, yeah. putting in dermal fillers from wherever they've got their, their stuff So from. they must be getting it sort of off the internet mm-hmm. because as well, a, a bit like um, remote Botox prescribing as you know the doctor will sit 200 miles away prescribe it and yeah surely he is responsible to the GMC for doing that but the provider who does it it's a uh, financial gain for course, the, the provider. Of course, but I know that if, if, if um, I need supplies, I have to write a script out mm. and send it through to the suppliers who supply uh, the product, the pharmaceutical company. Otherwise, you can't obtain it. So legally, you can't. Well, his main focus is safety. Mm. What we've learned from the PIP breast implant scandal and what we can do to protect vulnerable people. Do you think that what he's calling for is enough and is going to be a strong, a strong enough net to catch all the people who have psychological issues? Anything new like this, you have to do it to see how it goes and then improve it as time goes on but actually it's going to be how it's set up the cost involved the quangos involved he's talking about an ombudsman which yeah fine but is it going to be the same as the financial services ombudsman is it going to take six months for them to look into something i mean we already have the gmc in place that screen a lot of these surgeons and doctors and everybody they have to be registered with them to work here so surely that's a good starting point and and just you know increase their powers to do that because at the moment i know for a fact there are foreign surgeons coming over here that are not gmc registered they're doing consultations in hotel rooms and taking people to turkey and other places similar and you know they've got to start off there and i know they've been reported and i know the gmc are powerless to actually do anything about it but just being gmc registered just doesn't mean anything no it doesn't you could be your gp's gmc registered yeah and And the worrying thing is when these young patients particularly the pip scandals they go to x y and z and they get given a whole sheet of the doctor's qualifications half of which they can buy anywhere and the top of it says gmc Mm. your gp's gmc Mm. would you want your gp doing a cosmetic operation on you so how do you feel about the cost (laughs) and the ombudsman involved if if the recommendations are put in place I think so many cosmetic surgeons have left their ethics on the floor somewhere and become sort of more business minded, which is nothing wrong with that if you can get a good balance. But they're sort of just wanting a conveyor belt of people to go through. So they're um, just building up their bank balance so they can go and live a life of Riley out in the Bahamas or something. And that's exactly what's happening. And that's why you've got these fly in, fly out doctors. It all looks very luxurious and uh, effective over here. And they think, oh, right, we can and sort of like uh, milk this for all it's damn worth and then clear off out with uh, no recourse whatsoever. You're nodding your head, Mr. Sajitra. How unregulated is the industry at the moment? I mean, it's very unregulated. I mean, in the past, I've spoken to a couple of chaps in Italy on a course, youngsters in the late 20s, and they, they were speaking to one of the professors from Rome who happened to be on this course. And they said, oh, what are you guys doing? They said, oh, we've just come over. To, they, they came to his private clinic in Rome. And they said, what, do, what have you come here to do? They said, oh, we just want to learn a little bit about rhinoplasties, uplifts. Why? Oh, because we're going to some big cosmetic hospital in the UK to work. And he was like, you can't do that. 
Yeah, because if there's a problem, we'll just come back to Italy. Yeah, but you know a bit more about that as well, don't you? The Italians, they're not allowed to actually take up a scalpel with a patient until they're fully qualified. So they can't get any work in Italy until they're experienced. And to get the experience, they come over here and work for some of the um, yeah, companies. But, I mean, the whole point of this mm. regulation is those people will be stopped from coming That's to this right. country. That's right, and they need to be. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Daniel Sinner, and today we're discussing cosmetic surgery. Joining me is Mr Nilesh Sajitra, a plastic surgeon and a member of the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons. Linda Briggs is one of the UK's leading independent cosmetic surgery advisors and has had over £30,000 of cosmetic surgery. And Sarah Burge has had over 150 cosmetic procedures and is an associate of many cosmetic surgery clinics worldwide. Talking about the cost, I mean, I mean, that's an issue that the government, that's the government's problem, really, because if you put it into perspective, the cost of the PIP scandal is huge. So if, for example, an implant registry was put in place, which we campaigned for several years, then maybe the PIP scandal would have been stopped at an, at an earlier phase. Is that just going to be another level of bureaucracy that both Linda and Sarah are concerned will swallow up a lot of the money and resources of people that just want to make a good business? I think primary it may do, but as a as a uh, as a surgeon, I think our primary focus is patient safety. If it does, if it's going to cost, it's going to cost, rather that than dealing with consequences that are going to cost or consequences that are not correctable. But isn't there the, already auditing facilities in hospitals? So if, if a hospital um, has an order of implants, they're audited through the system, aren't they? So they would I mean, have. But, but the surgeons aren't auditing. The, or, or, BARPS is the only organisation where we have to provide an audit. Otherwise, mm. we're off the register. Because in, in Malta, Whereas, is, yeah. Malta, for instance, um, I know that you can only buy... The surgeon can only buy implants if they're bought via the hospital and the hospital take a note of all the batch numbers, serial numbers, etc. And mm. then they're used in that patient. You can't even have, like we get here, surgeons come over with a suitcase full of cheap implants, black market implants, and they'll mm. use them and go away. I mean, so how are you going to make them register? I mean, with the, with the PIPs, the hospitals used to purchase them and mm. they used to write them in their diary, but no one used to look at them to say, has that person got pain or swelling or a problem and report it because there's no mechanism because oh, the government it. withdrew that but with registry. The, but with the PIP implants, I mean, I was al actually alerted to this many years before this exploded yeah, in the media yeah. and I'm sure you'll agree with me there because the surgeons, because when I was in the operating theatre, surgeons used to take out these these implants mm -hmm. and they could, say that they could see that th this was not the correct sort of substance, it wasn't uh, manoeuvrable as it should be and they're saying, should we be using this? I alerted the media, but no, they weren't interested in actually talking anything professional. They just wanted to carry on with their usual rubbish. And this is what I'm saying. It's good information and advice needs to get out on a bigger platform and a higher plane. But, but uh, how will some of these cowboy gone. surgeons knew that these implants were not good, but they were forced by the providers because they were cheap? So going back to Linda's question, how would this audit protect consumers from someone that comes over with a suitcase of mattress silicone? It's difficult to stop illegal, illegal activity, but, you know, if there's regulations and checks in place at every level, the hospital level, theatre level, surgeon level, and reporting back to a, a central audit office, then it makes it harder to do that. But it, this would only seem to affect established hospitals. If someone wants to go and do it in a back alley, set themselves up on as a practitioner in any of the streets that, you, that mm -hmm. we haven't already mentioned, that, not that's not, not going to really not protect vulnerable people, are they? Linda, I just want to pick up on this. You seem really concerned. Obviously, anyone that goes to the hospital, we're all happy that they will have enough protection if, if Sir Bruce's recommendations are put in place. Mm -hmm. But there will still be this black market operating that isn't oh, going yeah. to enough to protect consumers. But you, and I want, you're really concerned about that. Well, that's right, because it's always the vulnerable people at the bottom end of the food chain that don't have much money to spend on these things who want it because it's a lifestyle choice now. Um, it's like the people that used to turn up in a van and do Botox at lunchtime outside the offices and then disappear. And by the time you knew it wasn't going to work, it, you know, they were gone. So it's the same sort of principle. What, what do you want to see in place to protect these people? Th I, these, are pe these people seem to be neglected by this report. Mm, I, I don't know. You have to educate the public. Um, and then you have to try and uh, enforce the laws that come in. So if, if this then is get read in the summer and it's going to become a law, then 
an act, whatever, it, it needs to be enforced. At the moment, there isn't anybody out there enforcing the, the, the regulations that are in at the moment. Sarah Birch, mm. is, this a, a, this is something that you, that you are concerned about as well? There isn't anyone enforcing these rules at the moment and that Sir Bruce's report completely forgets about people who can't afford these procedures and will go down a back alley to go and get lunchtime Botox. And we are, well, not even that. I mean, they're turning to DIY sort of off the internet. They're sort of like ordering it from Canada or the US or wherever, Mongolia, and they're getting it delivered in a, a syringe and with no instructions and they're just, well, they have no idea of injectable techniques. And this is why I'm saying this is going to fast track a lot of people through A&E and it's going to cost our resources quite heavily. I mean I think mm. money is obviously the key objective here as well and obviously these vulnerable people as we said uh, need to keep their costs down but they're also desperate to in improve their looks. Um, and no, no amount of saying, oh, you don't need it, or perhaps try something different, or try a, a, a face peel or something else instead of an ejectable technique is going to change. They, they want to go down that route, and they, they won't stop until they get it. And unfortunately, these are the cases that are going to be afflicted and uh, fall you know, into the uh, accident and emergency. It's not only an English thing, though, is it? Because it, if you remember a couple of years ago, there was a, a young girl went from here to America to have injections in a hotel, um, fat injections into the butt, so. and, and she was killed because it was an illegal substance and the person doing it wasn't fully qualified. So it's a worldwide thing. It's not only here. And, and I think we probably would make a better move if we all got together as Europe and, and did it as a European thing because the French have already got a lot of uh, regulations in place and I see the Dutch have as well um, so it's just it, it's a Euro should be a European thing not just with us but I think we mustn't forget that of all all the thousands and thousands of uh, plastic surgery and cosmetic surgery that is successful, I mean, we mustn't lose the focus on that as well and how much it does change people's lives for the best. I mean, it is there for a purpose and it is there to change people's lives for the better. And final word from uh, Mr Nilesh Sujitra. I think education is very important um, to educate the public. Less trivialisation and glamour of it we need to ban things like advertising. So, for example, talking about fillers and classifying it, classifying it as a medical product will hopefully stop that. It will stop advertising. It will control which fillers come into the UK market. If you compare the fillers in the UK compared to the fillers in the States, in the States, probably about 14, 15 fillers. Here, over 100. Some of which have had rigorous testing, some of which have not. God knows what goes in various patients. The patients don't know. They think it's all the same. They think it's either temporary or permanent. They don't know the differences between any of the fillers. So hopefully that will regulate what comes onto the market and, and by having this register, who will actually administer them. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time for today's discussion. Thank you to all of my guests, Mr Nilesh Sajitra, a plastic surgeon and a member of the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons. Linda Briggs is one of the UK's leading independent cosmetic surgery advisors and has had over £30,000 of cosmetic surgery. And Sarah Burge has had over 150 cosmetic procedures and is an associate of many cosmetic surgery clinics worldwide. 